Are you interested to work on Reforged again? No. No, I am not. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm working on Stormgate now. Actually, you know what? Maybe this is a good year to do a retrospective on my career. I began my career in the game industry. I began my career uh, working in a bookstore, but the bookstore wasn't paying much. <laughs> it was paying $6 an hour in California, which not really a livable wage. I did have a college account, and that's why I was going to UCI, but the college account was running low, <clears throat> and it wasn't going to last the 3.5 years I needed to graduate with a degree. I had a choice to make. Do I try to find a career, or do I wait till that money runs out and then go into debt? And I didn't like the idea of going to debt. <clears throat> I've always been someone who, like, if I owe someone something, pay it back immediately. Like, that's just, I don't want to ever have someone holding money over me. Which is why I hate capitalism so much, because everyone's trying to get you in a chokehold with money debt. It was at that point that I started looking around, like, what career could I do? What could I, what could I do as a full-time job? Now, I dabbled in audio before, and I had a bunch of friends that I played, like, Network Marathon 2 with. <laughs> and we had decided uh, that we were going to form a game company. But, you know, they got jobs in the game industry, and I was like, well... Maybe I should get a job in the game industry. My roommates at the time were playing StarCraft. I tried it out and I liked it. I'm like, oh, this is pretty cool. And then I realized, oh, it's the same company that did Warcraft 2 and Warcraft 1, which I had loved. So I looked on the back of the box. What company made this? It's Blizzard Entertainment. Oh, okay. So I call 411 and that in America gives you its information and you can ask for the phone number. It's like a phone number directory that you can just call. And I asked for the number for Blizzard Entertainment and they gave it to me, which means that as it happened, they were in Irvine. And so I had lucked out. Uh, so that lucky event, number one, lucky event, number two, I called, cold called and asked them if they were looking for people who knew Macintosh computers because I was a big Macintosh guy. And the person I was cold calling was the receptionist. <laughs> And she happened, the reception happened to be right around the corner from QA and she happened to talk to Chris Sigety and all that all the time. So she knew what sort of things they were looking for. And it just so happened that the Macintosh version of Diablo and the Macintosh version of Starcraft were about to enter testing. And she said, yeah, let me give you to Chris Sigety. Chris Sigety, I talked to him, really, really cool dude. Uh, he's like, yeah, we need Macintosh testers, like, you know, post haste. <laughs> so... I went in for an interview. Everyone's dressed like me in like t-shirt and jeans. And it looks like a super chill environment, kind of dungeon like <laughs> in retrospect, because it was dark because, you know, CRT monitors and everything. I got a call at the bookstore and he offered me a job while I was there working at the bookstore. And he's like, you know, I know, you know, $8 an hour is all we can offer you at this time. So, you know, I know if you can't accept it, blah, blah, blah. That was a pay raise, <laughs> which I guess he didn't realize. Boom, I had a job at Blizzard Entertainment. So I, I went there, I worked in quality assurance. While I was working in quality assurance, I met Tim Campbell. Tim Campbell was also working in quality assurance at the time. And he showed me some tricks in the map editor and I got invested in making levels at that point. An opportunity arose, Warcraft 2 Battle.net edition. Uh, I, I worked on the Macintosh versions of Diablo, Macintosh version of Starcraft. I even did the on disk manual for the Mac Macintosh version of Starcraft. And uh, I don't know, everyone was really impressed with it, but it was just HTML with like a starry background and like I put all the same text. Like, I don't know, I, it w didn't seem impressive to me, but everyone really liked it. Because for the, for the Macintosh version of things, it was a little janky, like the devs were external. So getting stuff internally for them was sort of difficult. So they, they would just ask like, can you guys do something about this? Or I would notice, I think in this case, it was, I just like, oh, we need a manual. Oh, here's, I'll make one. Boom. And then it was in. So it was cool. And once you see like stuff you make go into a game, <clears throat> you're like, I want to do more. I want to see more of my stuff go out into the world. And the opportunity arose with Warcraft 2 Battle.net edition first. And I just made a really honestly shitty <laughs> War 2 multi, uh, uh, map. And I forget what it's called. I think they ended up calling it frog legs or something. I don't know what they called it. 
I don't remember. I just submitted the map and then they told me that they were going to use it. I don't know exactly what happened, to be honest with you. That's how disconnected I was from things going on upstairs. But uh, as far as I know, it's in Ward 2 Battle.net Edition. Uh, but it was just a ladder map. And then I, you know, I got addicted to it. So I'm like, okay, what other opportunities are there? And then we got a call. Hey, we're looking for new StarCraft maps for the N64, the Nintendo 64 version of StarCraft that's coming. And I'm like, oh, yeah. So me and uh, Chris Arecci uh, and another dude, we got together and we're like, oh, let's make this thing together. <clears throat> and so I wrote an outline of the story for it, which involved the infested Stukov and him coming back. And uh, and then I did the triggers for it and Chris Arecci did the layout. So uh, the this was our first co-op split screen campaign <laughs> mission. And it was the only new campaign mission that went into the StarCraft 64 version of, of the Nintendo 64 version of StarCraft. So that was dope. Yes, the return of Stukov. If you don't like Stukov returning, you can blame me. That's my fault. Uh, but yeah, Chris Metzen like, did a, a pass on the dialogue and, and what you saw. I don't know, if you've played the mission, I think you can get it online. Like They hacked it out of the, the Nintendo version and they put it online. It's not quite the same without the split screen. It was also a very difficult mission because it required intricate, like you had to like use the ghost lockdown to stop things from seeing you and like sneak by and stuff. It was just a, it was a overly difficult mission for an N64 version of StarCraft. I did work on Diablo 2. I was still in QA, by the way, during this time period. I wasn't like officially a level designer yet. Uh, so I did Warcraft 2 Battle Edition, StarCraft 64, while I was still in QA, <clears throat> they just gave me additional time to do it. And because I was hourly paid, I just clock those hours, right? Diablo 2, I was one of the team leads for the Mac. Um, not super exciting. It's just making, making lists of things, but it gave me an in-depth look into how their prefix suffix system worked. And I <laughs> often have used that in the past in new games as a way to generate items because I think it's still cool and it definitely works. Next up, there was a call for people to move up to do the StarCraft trigger maps of the month. Me and Matt Morris got called up to, to be those guys um, after we submitted some maps. Now, obviously, I had a huge advantage and I had the StarCraft 64 version of a co-op campaign map that uh, no one else had. Um, but yeah, it was, it was pretty obviously going to be me and him. And then I, I was working on the trigger map of the month program. So I did, I think, four or five maps. I want to say I archived them and I put them on the patron Patreon so you can grab them there. It's harder to get from Blizzard directly because they like effed up the link or something, but <clears throat> they still exist and you can still grab them. My favorite, of course, being Deception, which was a uh, single player stealth mission where you control like a ghost and a couple other units and you have to like sneak your way through the space and like you go to these computer terminals and you get information and it, like I put in all sorts of Easter eggs and stuff without throughout the mission. And there's even a stealth rating at the end, depending upon how few units you killed and a couple of other factors, but that introduced the Camaran pirates. <laughs> that was entirely my fiction. Um, and apparently they use that later on, which is interesting. Then the big one, the one everyone knows me for Warcraft three reign of chaos, obviously Still my biggest title to date. No, wait, I have one higher rated, but that's a mobile game. I don't think anyone cares about that. Anyways, Warcraft 3, Reign of Chaos, my claim to fame. Had a really good time working on it. Did not have the best boss situation. Uh, I won't go into that. But I got to make The Calling of Stratholme and The Dungeons of Dalaran. Those are my two top favorite missions to make because I put so much love into those. But also, just every mission that I worked on, I really enjoyed. Um, Next, the Frozen Throne, obviously. Oh, that's where the Dungeons of Dalaran is. And <clears throat> definitely, I think, my top mission between all of them. Like, even I pref I like the Dungeons of Dalaran better than the Culling of Stratholme because the Dungeons of Dalaran just has so much fun stuff in it that you can find. I wish I had done, like, a Easter egg percentage or something or, like, a secrets percentage like I did for the Deception map, but oh well. Next up, World of Warcraft. I did some quests, early quest design. I helped... Uh, with some of the early direction for how quests should be written. Not much of that got followed, to be honest with you. This is my second highest rated game of all time. <laughs> I had a lot of fun writing quests. Like, it was fun to just get into the writing again and just be doing writing. Now, in for Warcraft 3, TFT, and ROC, I did a lot of writing for them, too. Like, I wrote 
some of the mission synopsis stuff. I wrote item text, a lot of item text, and I wrote all of the tool tips for Reign of Chaos. And in fact, it was, uh, I asked for the pipe codes to do colors and I was the one who color coded everything by hand. And I was the one who got them to implement a data variable so that I could call the data from somewhere. I don't know how it worked. It was magic, but I could call the data and get it from a table as opposed to um, writing a fixed number or va being more vague. So I got exact, I'm the reason that there's exact numbers in those tooltips and things like that. Uh, and I think those were some of the first tooltips of that caliber ever put into a game. I, I want to sort of claim that as mine, but I don't think I can because I'm sure it happened before. So that's something I'm proud of that nobody really knows about or cares about. Good tooltips. Who gives a shit? I care. All right. Anyways, moving on. Uh, World of Warcraft got did the the quest design and writing. Didn't really get my way on a lot of stuff for other reasons that I won't go into. Um, things like Zevra hooves dropping stupidly. Not my fault. If it were me, it would have been four Zevra hooves, and I just would have required like forty eight of them or something. So the art was done first, and then we would write stuff around it. So Sammy would. Sammy was a freaking legend like he would just boom 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 here's like 60 icons it's like what <laughs> he would do that in a matter of like a couple weeks or one week even um and then we would just have this plethora of stuff to go through and like parcel out to what sort of items we want world of warcraft was a bittersweet thing for me i left before it shipped some of the things that i hated about everquest snuck into world of warcraft because of certain people who loved EverQuest so much. Nothing I can do about that. My quest text still is in there in the classic version for a number of things like the Buzzbox quest and Sergra Darkthorn, though a lot of that got edited because of pettiness. Like the original Sergra Darkthorn was a uh, misandrist. She hated men. <laughs> <clears throat> so now we get into non-Blizzard because that was my, not my last <laughs> foray into Blizzard, but uh, the last time that I did something that shipped with Blizzard. So um, next I worked at Oddworld Inhabitants. Now Oddworld Inhabitants was in uh, San Luis Obispo, California. It was a great little company. Um, it had a strong visionary leader in Lauren Lanning and it had a very strong heart from Sherry McKenna, who is my favorite CEO, I think of all time. And she had a holistic approach to game development and everything. And there was no overtime. You could do overtime, but it had to be approved and it was paid. And uh, she made sure that we had bagels instead of donuts and things like that. Everyone had to have a gym membership and we were all encouraged to use it. And like, it was just a very holistic and enjoyable place to work. And I met some really cool people there, including one I did an interview with who, you, and you should watch that one. Sounds like dream CEO, too good to be true. Well, yeah, I mean, okay, so let me tell you what happened. <laughs> I worked on Oddworld Stranger's Wrath, which if you haven't played it, it is now on PC. It doesn't feel the same as the Xbox version, though, the original Xbox version. The original Xbox version was programmed specifically for the Xbox, and it was really good. And um, I really enjoyed working on it. I didn't get to do... I came in towards like the mid part of the... like They were already sort of moving forward on like all the stuff. I got to design two boss fights and two bosses, Elbows Freely and Fatty McBoom Boom. And those are like crazy, crazy boss fights. Um, I really enjoyed that. Uh, it taught me a lot about boss fight design and combat design. And if you haven't played Oddworld Stranger's Wrath, I highly recommend it. Uh, it's like this perfect mix of a first person shooter with a third person like action sort of game. And the stories are really good. And the cinematics are really good. Oddworld just has this aesthetic. But their one problem was that they had to deal with finding a publisher, getting the game out there. And it was going to be an Xbox exclusive. So that was problematic to begin with. But I assume that part of the development, what had paid for the development to this point was it being an Xbox exclusive. But Oddworld Stranger's Wrath got the shaft. And the reason it got the shaft was that EA convinced Lorne Lanning to use them again, despite having been screwed by them in the past. So EA says, oh, th this time things will be different. It'll be so good and we'll market the hell out of your game. 
And whatever reason, Lauren Landing and Sherry must have believed them and they gave him a chance. And so we finished the game and we shipped and it went out there and we got two magazine spreads. This is in 2005. We got two magazine spreads. And then we were like, that's it. What else are you going to how else are you going to market this? You promised us like mass marketing and you were going to sell the hell out of this game. And EA came back with not even joking. Sorry, we don't know how to market this game. It's too strange. Ah! <laughs> Never trust EA. Never trust EA. That's that was one of the biggest lessons I learned working at Oddworld. So as a result of that, the company was going to shut down, and uh, they did. They did shut down. That game was rated an eighty-eight. <clears throat> so an eighty-eight is the same as uh, Diablo Two. Uh, War 2 Battle Edition has an 89. These are Metacritic ratings, by the way. Uh, StarCraft 64 has an 80. So everything I've done so far is above 80. So now we get into the lowest rated? Yeah, this is the lowest rated game I've ever worked on. So I went to work at a company called The Collective. And The Collective was a weird company. <laughs> Founded by like two Scottish brothers, uh, the Hare brothers. Um, they had done a few titles that were like interesting, like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and uh, they did Star Wars, the prequel trilogy games. At The Collective, I worked on a game called The Da Vinci Code. This game, okay, first of all, it's like a nine-month development cycle. Second of all, my the lead designer for it was an alcoholic. And so I claim lead design for this game because I did more work than she ever did. It was just a grueling nine month cycle where I ended up doing, I designed most of the puzzles in the game. I wrote almost all of the game's dialogue. I didn't do some of the barks. Some people helped out on the barks. Yeah, it was just a grueling drag to the end kind of thing, all to get a 54 <laughs> rating. <laughs> uh, recently, I discovered that there are people who still love this game to this day, and I so glad for that but the problem with the game was that uh richard hare decided that it had to have combat and i'm not even joking i was in a meeting with him and i'm like why do you want combat in this game and his response was well we need to sell a few copies don't we and i'm like what <laughs> like he'd never heard of adventure games before like he thought that adventure games can't possibly work but they can and if you put combat on top of an adventure game all you do and and let's face it it's the da vinci code what do you think people what kind of game do you expect from the da vinci code you're expecting an adventure game you don't expect to have to fight a cop <laughs> or a bunch of them it just didn't make any sense so that was frustrating and then i worked on silent hill 5 homecoming uh i did a lot of early work with the writers helping develop the story and i did some early level designs all of that's on the pa Patreon. Uh, you can actually look at the Da Vinci Code stuff too. I put all of the design documents for these games that have shipped onto the Patreon for this purpose. You can go see old game design docs and, and see what happened. Silent Hill 5 was a mess. It got a 71, so that's not terrible. It's probably just because it's Silent Hill, but it had a lot of issues in that uh, a lot of gameplay changes happened and then the writers were brought back in and then the writing kind of fell apart as a result. I don't think any of my stuff made it into the final game. If it did, I don't know about it because I haven't played it. Next up. So so uh with the okay, so there's a missing game here that I don't like talking about, but I've removed it from my ludography because it's so shit. And I don't didn't technically do anything for it except like copy and paste text from one file to another. And I'm not even joking. That was literally what I was doing was copying and pasting text from one file to another file in order to make it work stupidest job complete waste of my time and talent so this was at shiny shiny entertainment and uh the lead for that game uh who was dax berg garbage designer garbage shouldn't be allowed in the game industry <laughs> should be removed he put in that game now this is the golden compass so the golden compass is based on the his dark materials uh franchise and they made uh and the, we were doing the first book. And if you read the book, it's about a little girl 
called Lyra, who lies to get things done that helps destroy the evil. That's like the basis summary I can give. It, it's actually a good book. I recommend reading it. I don't recommend playing the game, though. The Golden Compass was a terrible game, not just because it was a terrible game in general, but because specifically, so there's dialogue text going by on the screen. People are talking. While that's going on, you play a mini game to smash logs or like dodge bullets. Had nothing to do with anything in the game. It was just ridiculous. And I know a lot of people bring up Undertale, but it's nothing like Undertale. <laughs> it was terrible. In a game about lying successfully, you would want to have dialogue choices or set things up such that you can make a successful lie. That's the game. That's what the game should have been. But no, it was a action adventure with mini games. Terrible game. I go to Shiny. Shiny sucks. Uh, I tell them they suck. Uh, they fire me. <laughs> Not much of a story there. Um, other than that, Daxberg went on to make one of the worst games ever made, G.I. Joe. So I was right. Anyways, then I went to Supervillain Studios and uh, we were going to make an RPG for the Wii. And we were calling it Weezard. <laughs> And I did a bunch of cool lore stuff and like we got art for it and like my characters were coming to life and then they got bought by green screen, which was a bunch of former EA executives who promised to take care of payroll for X amount of time and then screwed us over and said, you have to lay off half your employees. So at that point, I'm like, okay, you're fucked. Yeah. Uh, if we're not doing Wizard, you don't need me. I'm going to go do something else. And that, that was the point where I moved to China. I'd been, I was so, this is in 2008. I was so fed up with fucking bullshit. And also this was the year that uh, Obama got elected. And then he picked a bunch of bankers for all of his cabinet positions. So I was just completely fed up with America as a whole. I'm like, I need to go somewhere else. I'm done with, <laughs> I'm done with this shit. The game industry in America is toxic. The, we're never going to have healthcare. We're never, and we still don't to this day. We're never going to have anything that we need. And whenever there's a layoff, like people are screwed and I hate it. So I went to China, worked at Ubisoft Shanghai. Now they lied to me to get me there. Uh, they promised me that I would be in charge of an RTS project. They promised me that I would have as many team members as I wanted. And they basically lied. They said that I would get my own project. I'd be the lead of. When I got there, it turned out, no, you are the senior designer, one of several, <clears throat> and you will be under this lead designer. And I was like, okay, well, you've already got me in China, so I guess I'm kind of trapped here. At that point, uh, it was going to be a Heroes of Might and Magic game. So I was like, eh, you know what, I'll, I'll deal with it. Uh, I was stoked to work on that franchise because <clears throat> I had fond memories of the first one when I was a kid. That was going to be amazing. But <laughs> then I met, uh, you got Shanghai? Yeah, <laughs> kind of. But by expats, <laughs> French people shanghai me. <clears throat> Chinese people are amazing. Those are some of the best friends I made were over there. Hmm. Um, you can't be lead in Ubisoft unless you're French. That is true. That is what I discovered while I was working there. Uh, so I was working on the Heroes of Might and Magic franchise. Things were in flux. While that was happening, they had what they call the Design Summit. They grab a bunch of senior designers and senior like artists and stuff, and they put them into a meeting to analyze a game that is either coming to Ubisoft or is part of the Ubisoft lineup somewhere in the world <clears throat> to analyze it and give their take on how to fix it. So the game that they brought to us and they brought me into this meeting was called I Am Alive. I Am Alive was supposed to be like this apocalypse survival game, but what had ended up being created was this grappling hook game. <laughs> and ironically, the grappling hook was the only part of the game that was fun. Um, but basically that you were just running around like fires and like explosions and stuff. And it wasn't well thought out. I don't know what happened during the development of that, but I imagine Ubisoft meddling had something to do with it, <clears throat> as I learned later. So I pitched for I Am Alive uh, that you take a father and a daughter. The father's like a fireman, strong, uh, and the daughter's like a 
12 year old kind of hacker who like loves computers and stuff. And then you do like puzzle elements where the father has to like move things or lift her up into ducts. And then she crawls through the ducts to get to the panel to rewire something to get you through. And you're both escaping through from this apocalyptic thing to get to your mom. And then the three of you have to escape or whatever tragedy ensues. Uh, so I pitched that and everyone loved it. And they're like, okay, you're in charge. I'm like, what the fuck? I thought I was here for the RTS. I was working on Heroes of Might and Magic, remember? They were like, yeah, but we this I Am Alive project is coming to the Shanghai studio. It would mean a lot for the studio because it means additional funding. And uh, we have, you know, otherwise there'll be layoffs. So they got me with that. <laughs> I'm like, oh, <clears throat> fine. I will save jobs. Um, so then they made me the lead of I Am Alive, lead design, um, but not really the lead design. It was still the senior designer title and they wouldn't say I was in charge of it, but all the decisions were going through me. And then while I was doing that, the Heroes of Might and Magic team did a presentation. And in the presentation, they said, we need Dave Freed on our project. So this is a very short time at Ubisoft. And I've already swapped projects and 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 being pulled back and forth between two of them. I actually was wanted to make Heroes of Might and Magic into a tactics game, like a Final Fantasy style tactics game. Um, and they shot me down saying that there's no money in it, but whatever. RTS was fine, but then it wasn't going to be an RTS because Serge Hasquit shows up. <laughs> Serge Hasquit is the head of the was the head of the editorial board for Ubisoft, and his only game that he ever worked on was Rayman Legends or Rayman, <clears throat> the original Rayman. From that, he somehow became the head of the editorial board, which is a bunch of self fart sniffing dipshits who read articles about Shigeru Miyamoto and then extrapolate ridiculous theories from it um, and try to pretend that they are the be all know all end of all game design everywhere and that they they are super geniuses and it's fucking pathetic. So Serge Hasquit shows up and there's a meeting and I'm asked to attend for Heroes of Might and Magic. And during this meeting, this dipshit Serge just sits there like, doing this like while we're while other people are trying to explain how we're going about the game design process and the art and showing him stuff and i'm not even joking everyone thinks this is not real but this is exactly what happened after most of the pitches are done he like stands up all of a sudden and he walks over to the board and he writes x b y a and he goes you see this is an enemy and i'm like what and it's one of those things where when you're pretending to be an auteur genius <laughs> which doesn't exist but when you're pretending to be it you do stupid shit like this um where you make vague statements and then expect everyone to like pretend to understand and in the case of serge hasquit that's what 90 percent of them did they would pretend to understand what he meant or they would start fabricating why he said that and as it was explained to me, he's like, oh, I think what he's saying is the buttons that you press, like the feel of the buttons should be how you determine uh, how an enemy is made. And I'm like, that's stupid. And yeah, I did that. <laughs> I'm like, That's dumb. That's not how we should be making a game. We have a really strong art department. We can design abilities based around what sort of things they're creating. And that's how it worked for <laughs> i beg your pardon that's insane yeah it was insane this was insane i felt like i was going mad because people were accepting this shit and i'm like and you build around the art and you can design abilities and, and things like that around how those interactions work and that's how we've done that's how we've done everything in the past like every game i've worked on that's how you did stuff um it's you never design around the button presses because the button presses can be changed to feel good dumbass <laughs> I didn't say that last part, but I wish I had. And he got red. I never seen anyone get red like that before. But yeah, clearly uh, that meeting ended pretty quick after that, as did uh, my career at Ubisoft. <laughs> but not before I got in. So the editorial board, while they were there, they uh, made an offer to answer any questions about the editorial board. And... Uh, I posted before on Twitter, I think, but also it's on my Patreon, I think. But basically, I print. I had a printout of questions that um, you were supposed to be anonymous. So 
I gave them to the producer for the project to read. And then he attributed it to me before reading them. And I'm like, fuck it, just give it to me. I'll read it. And basically they were questions like, um, so for I am alive, uh, while I was going through all of the old project files, I found their original documentation for their pitch. The original pitch for I am alive, <clears throat> and this is in 2012. Um, the original pitch for I am alive, this is all in 2009. The pitch was like a couple years back. So I don't know exactly when it was, uh, I'm forgetting, but the pitch was a four person team moving through a zombie apocalypse, working together with different abilities to get to end goals. And then like missions are done like that. Does that sound familiar? Cause it did to me. <laughs> It sounded like a Valve game that I know very well. It sounded to me like Left 4 Dead. So my question was, looking back on uh, how your feedback changed I Am Alive from its original vision, would you say that it was a mistake, <laughs> given that you could have had Left 4 Dead a year before Left 4 Dead came out? <laughs> oh, the glares. The glares. Yeah, the editorial board was not excited to get that question. And then I had some other questions, like one of them being, do you need to be French to be on the editorial board? And they said no. And then I said, how many people on the editorial board are not French? Goose egg. Zero. So whatever. Anyways, I completely owned them. Uh, I knew I was going to get the axe. Uh, they tried to like make a mockery of me after like the person in charge of the Ubisoft Shanghai studio, uh, which by the way, I think is predominantly a money laundering operation. She told me, oh, you aren't even good at design. And I'm like, what the fuck would you know about design? You don't even like games, fuck off. <laughs> that's how that meeting went. Fun, fun, fun. All right, that's Heroes of Might and Magic, I Am Alive. And you would think that would be the last time I ever worked for an Ubisoft studio, but it's not. Anyways, I moved to... <laughs> I moved to Sweden to work at Tarsier, a nice little studio. I have nothing bad to say about the people working there. They're all really good people. Um, they just didn't have good management sense. Um, and I tried to help them with that. So I worked on Little Big Planet for the Vita. I just helped them design some early drafts of what the game could be. And then I helped them design a couple puzzles and stuff for, for maybe it got in there. I don't even know. I was told I was going to be working on a new game. And so I was pitching a new game that was going to be a MOBA 4v4 um, shooter, uh, uh, spaceship combat, um, top down. So uh, that could have been cool. Didn't happen because, so Sony was contracting them and they, Sony had asked them Hey, if you could do anything with the Little Big Planet license, what would you do? <clears throat> and I'm like, uh oh, those are alarm bells. Because I'm like, if they're asking you that, they're not happy with just porting Little Big Planet 2. Like, that's not enough for them. So you need to pitch something exciting that really delves into the Vita features. So I gave them two game pitches, and I'm like, either of these could work. One of them was like a fantastic contraptions thing where the levels were like um, more complicated stuff and you could build something and then you had to like get your get it to go through the level and you could like manipulate certain parts on the way and people could do it any which way they wanted it's like a, if you've played fantastic contraptions or if you haven't played it try fantastic contraptions i think it's a web game um and then the other one i don't remember um and unfortunately i didn't write down i didn't uh i think the only documentation i saved was the Hyperion documents. So those I think are on my patron. The end of it is basically that because they said they were just going to port Little Big Planet 2 instead of going with one of my ideas, uh, Sony cut their funding because they found someone else to code and port Little Big Planet 2. And as a result, I they couldn't afford me anymore. So uh, dick move, getting me to come out to Sweden and then not listening to me and then losing your funding as a result. I understand why it happened though. And it has something to do with Yante law. So in Sweden, there's this thing called Yante law, which is basically that you are not better than anyone else. You are not above anyone else. Everyone is the same. 
Like if you think you're better, you're a dickhead. Basically, that's how it works. And unfortunately, when you are brought in for your experience <laughs> and wisdom <laughs> and you try to express that to them, like, here's what I think is going on. Here's here are two options for what you could do. Even in that scenario, <clears throat> I got seen as like a, a problem maker. <laughs> And so they didn't listen to me. And as a result of that, uh, they shafted themselves. Little Big Planet Vita did come out and they did make uh, little monsters, I think. And those are both really good games and I recommend them. Um, unfortunate that it didn't work out for me, but hey, you know. And then I worked on a game with Ant Hive Studios called Critterville, which was basically going to be a Animal Crossing style game. And unfortunately it didn't work out. Uh, I only got partial payment on the last payment. It was kind of a mess. And it doesn't really exist out in the world anyways. So <laughs> that was unfortunate. That was a short one. Then I went to work for Spicy Horse. Spicy Horse was American McGee's company. And there's another person who bought the auteur genius thing. He is retired from games as far as I can tell. He just sails around on his boat with his family and do, does vlogs now. And he has a... Oh, no. He has a successful... Uh, uh, merchandise business he sells like creepy dolls and what do you call them plushies plush plush plushes plushies and then he's actually doing really well with that and honestly i think that's a good place for him <clears throat> because people have always liked his like creepy concepts and not necessarily not not the best game designer unfortunately but while i was there i worked on akanero demon hunters which was the little red riding hood mythos this is my second lowest rated game by the way with a 55 the first being Da Vinci Code at 54. It was an interesting place to work. A lot of weird stuff happened there. I think I could do an entire two hours just on this, but I won't. <laughs> you can play Akinero Demon Hunters. It's on Steam. It's a Diablo style game. A lot of the stuff that I initially designed uh, didn't make it in. The primary thing that I was most interested in seeing was the ability system being interchangeable. So we would release abilities into the world and you defeat these monsters to get the ability, and then you get to use those abilities and level them up. Those monsters disappear at some point in like say, but by season. And then the next season there's different abilities. And the whole point of this was to increase the value of the original abilities because then we had the open market system where people could buy, sell, trade these. The reason that the Diablo 3 system didn't work is because you could infinitely generate all the fucking things in the game, so of course the value is going to go down over time and destroy the player experience. But if you have it seasonal and those things go away, then there's a reason to have them and like buy and sell and trade them. But apparently Blizzard can't understand something that I did. Oh, while I was there, I also worked on Plants vs. Zombies Warfare, but we never got credited for any of the shit we did for that, so it's kind of crazy. We were working with PopCap at the time. There's so many stories, actually, because this short period in Shanghai, China, a lot of crazy shit happened. So here's the unbelievable part of my career. Uh, Blue Byte hires me. Blue Byte is an Ubisoft company, and Blue Byte was warned about me. <laughs> they were told I was unmanageable. <laughs> And they told me that they were told that I was unmanageable. And I said, that's probably accurate. And I flat out told this guy, <clears throat> this the person who was in charge of this product, this is Assassin's Creed Identity. If you lie to me or if you do things that I find devious or deceptive or make things miserable for the designers, I will call it out. I will call you out. So don't hire me if that bothers you. They hired me anyways. Okay. <clears throat> uh, guess what? Working conditions at Blue Bite were fucking miserable. Designers were all demoralized. I went around. So so it started with just like one or two people like going, uh, you know, we don't really get to make any decisions. And then it spiraled into like everyone hated working there. <laughs> this is insane. And uh, I did interviews. Like I did one-on-one -on -one interviews. I just did this. No one told me to do this. No one allowed me to do this. I just said, I want to talk to everyone at the studio. Is that all right? And they were like, uh, for what purpose? And I'm like, uh, there's a problem here and I need to investigate. And they said, um, well, we'd rather you, you know, don't. And I said, well, all right, I'll just set it up. <laughs> and I just did it. So I just interviewed all the designers at the studio and all of them had similar stories of absolute misery being told 
what they can and can't do by people who were not designers. Basically, the producers were in charge in Germany. And I didn't realize that's like how it kind of works at most of the German studios. But uh, yeah, it was demoralizing everyone. So I, I did one on one interviews, took a bunch of notes, and then I did a survey. Uh, survey monkey. <laughs> I sent it out to all of them and they, and 90% of them answered back. And so I took that into a meeting with the executives and I said, 90% of your designers are thinking about leaving. <laughs> you have a problem. And I went through it step by step. Like, here's the issues. Designers need more autonomy. They have, they feel like they have no agency to make decisions. You keep stomping on their decisions when they make it. This needs to be changed. End result, I basically was uh, finished my contract uh, remotely. <laughs> they did not like being told all that information, even though it was true. Eventually, they did oust the person who was causing most of the problems. But <clears throat> I'm told that that was a bad thing. I have no idea. Uh, the people there who stayed seemed to be happier after he was gone, but whatever. What do I know? Next up, Puzzle Nation. We're getting into freelancer territory, so there's a lot of things happening simultaneously. But uh, I think at this point I had like three or four clients. Um, but Puzzle Nation was the major one. Like they were the one I was full time for for two years. And while I was working with Puzzle Nation, so this was a magazine company that did crossword stuff. <clears throat> and they had a backlog of thousands and thousands and thousands, like probably millions of puzzles. And so they wanted to have a mobile app that had the puzzles in them. So they had created one already and it was doing very, very poorly. Like they were making like, I don't know, a thousand dollars a month, something like that. So I was hired to do design, user experience, analytics, and, and a bunch of other stuff. It was like a three man team. And so the first thing I did is I went through their analytics stuff <clears throat> and I looked at the demographics and the demographics for the game skewed quite old, 40 plus, majority 50 plus, men and women. Um, <clears throat> and once I did that analysis, I knew what the problem was. <laughs> the problem was that the app currently that they had shipped had some esoteric design and it what you had to like drag to purchase things and like it was confusing and an old person definitely wasn't going to get it so i redesigned everything for a magazine format so instead of uh dragging in individual puzzles you see a magazine cover so you get the beautiful art of the magazine cover like you would see in a storefront laid on like a shelf and then you can click on that to purchase that and get the puzzles and then you can click on the magazine and it opens up and you can play the puzzle when we did that change Numbers started going up and up and up and up. And I think it was like, by the time, uh, towards the end of my time there, they were making like a thousand dollars a day. So I naturally thought, oh, well, you know, clearly this market improvement has come from my influence and the things that I helped do. Surely that will be worth increasing my pay to a normal rate, I had taken quite a pay cut to work with them and also a substantial Christmas bonus. So no increase in pay, citing that, oh, well, we thought because you were in Thailand, you would take a lower pay. And I'm like, no, the deal was if I proved my worth that you would increase my pay to a reasonable salary for what I'm bringing to the table. And then I got a Christmas bonus of like $200. <laughs> Fuck off. So I quit. Um, I worked on a lot of stuff at Penny Dell, uh, Penny Dell Sudoku. I worked on a bunch of stuff that probably didn't ship uh, or may have in some form. But the main one that I liked was uh, I, wor I made Word Ventures the Vampire Pirate. Now, the concept came from uh, another uh, guy named David Fetzelgraf. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Uh, really good concept, which is like a word search. And when you find something in the word search, that item, so let's say you find the word key, that becomes a key that goes to your inventory and then you can use the key to open stuff. And from that concept, I made a whole game called Word Ventures the Vampire Pirate. And I think you can find it on Google Play or the iPhone App Store. And I recommend it. There's a demo version so you can see if it's even your cup of tea or there used to be, I'm not sure right now. So Assassin's Creed Identity, I barely worked on it. That was mostly um, name eluding me, damn it. <clears throat> someone else but i did some early concepts for it and they criticized me saying that the item drop system was too diablo-y 
I'm like, okay, sorry. Uh, so while I was working with Puzzle Nation, I also worked with a company called Pixelmatic. Pixelmatic was doing uh, a space RTS, but I primarily worked on Warhammer 40k Carnage, which was a total mess. I was just a consultant on it, but what I recognized was that their number systems didn't really make sense. You were leveling in a weird way, and there needed to be all sorts of adjustments. And what we found out was there was an entrenched programmer who felt he was a designer who had coded things in such a way that his removal was impossible. <laughs> and he was refusing to make any changes. So that was a shit experience. I did get paid for it. Can't complain, but don't really have anything to do with the final result of Warhammer 40k Carnage, in my opinion, though I think they did follow some of my advice. Next up, I worked for a studio in Thailand called Infinity Levels, and I was just a consultant, um, but I did go to their studio to see what was going on there. And I worked on two games, Ranch Run and Blades of Revenge. So the problem with Infinity Levels was that they had some misdirection from their lead designer that had taken them down some overly complicated paths. So a lot of my advice was about simplification and marketing. Unfortunately, while I was working on that, uh, I took a vacation in Japan with my family. And while I was in Japan with my family, they devalued my shares in the company to nothing. And she sold it to a friend. And then he laid me off while I was in Japan. And uh, so that was super exciting, fun stuff. Uh, but I'd also given them geek words. So my retirement plan was I'd still like to work on a game. And that game was going to be Geek Words. Geek Words was basically crossword puzzles based on TV shows. I would just make the crossword puzzle and put it up there. And each episode of a TV show was a crossword puzzle. And it had all the major events of it and like the main characters and things that were going on and plot lines and stuff. So it was a way to keep up with a show or remind and refresh yourself about a show or to demonstrate really in-depth knowledge of a show. And I thought that would be a fun thing to make. So I gave that idea to them. What a jerk move when a company does that behind someone's back. Yeah, it was pretty brutal. And they also now had my Geek Words property that I had I was I had reservations about giving it to them because it was a really good concept. The problem was that we couldn't get it polished enough. We did ship a version of it that went out and uh, it just had a lot of bugs and we didn't have enough content yet. And I'm like, this is something I was supposed to be doing <laughs> over the course of years when I had nothing else to do than watch TV shows and make puzzles about them. So we had we hired a bunch of people to quickly crank out puzzles for it. Not all of them were great quality. Some of them were good. Some of them were not so good. Um, mine themselves were not so great. I hadn't really developed a rhythm for it yet. And now I've fallen out of, uh, I haven't done them in a while. So I'd, <laughs> it would be starting from scratch effectively. But it exists. It's on Steam which uh, graciously someone helped co-develop and uh, he gets 50% of anything from the Steam sales. So if you're interested in that sort of game, please go to Steam and try out Geek Words. Um, I'll tell you what, I'll do a sale. <laughs> I'll do a New Year's sale or something um, just because uh, I want to get enough money that they have to give me money that I can then give him 50% of. But anyways, I got that property back from them. That, that's the only good outcome of the story. Uh, in lieu of pay, back pay that they owed, owed me, I got back Geek Words and all of it, and they were very gracious about that handover. They didn't screw me over or anything. So there's that, I guess. That at least was fair. Edge Case Games, which is a UK company, was working with a company in China <clears throat> in Zhuhai which is a beautiful city. I really like Zhuhai. It's a beach city. Uh, anyways, they hired me to as a consultant to come to China and help them sort of figure out what was going on in terms of the Chinese team and also contribute to the game design. So this was an unnamed mech combat game, uh, very closely based on Gundam, like too closely based on Gundam. <clears throat> and that was largely the Chinese influence because they have no qualms about just copying shit. So we were going to bring our own Western take to it so that it wasn't Gundam. <laughs> Anyways, I demanded basically $10,000 upfront because I wasn't going to go to China 
<laughs> and get fucked over again. I wanted to have enough money that I could basically be like, fuck you, I'm flying out in business class. <laughs> so I wanted 10,000 up front, no strings attached. Um, they agreed and uh, the salary was good. So I went and I basically the first week I was just walking around the studio, listening to how things were going and getting a sort of a vibe. And I realized that <clears throat> pretty quickly that the mood had soured towards the Western developers of the studio. And that because of the nepotistic way that these companies work in China, the wrong person didn't like them anymore. I explained to them like this project is already dead. I definitely was more diplomatic about it, but I was like, this is doomed. <laughs> and um, yeah, about like a couple months later, after I'd already signed a lease, by the way, it, it, it came out that, yeah, they were, the Chinese company was already planning on ending the relationship and like it was already doomed. And like, there's a whole bunch of complicated shit in the interim of that. And when I was first initially there, it almost seemed like there was hope because they were very excited to have me because I'd worked on Warcraft 3 and like I was helping with the story and all this stuff. But uh, the relationship was already doomed. So there was nothing I could do. Thank God I got that 10,000 up front. <laughs> and they paid me for all the time I was there. And I was able to hand my lease off to someone else who had to move because uh, one of the other people who he had been living with got laid off. So he needed his own apartment. So I gave him mine. So whew, like that was a very amicable parting of ways <laughs> given the circumstances. But it's only because I fucking argued so hard up front to get what I needed to be comfortable in case something like that happened. And I'm so glad I did. And I always do that now. If I can't be remote and you want me on site, you got to pay. And, and you should all adhere to that because you do not want to get left in a foreign country with no money to get you out. It is a bad situation. So finally, here is the good experience in Europe. Uh, I went to Germany to work at Wuga. I worked on... Okay, the experience with this particular game wasn't great, but the experience with the studio was awesome. Uh, and I worked on a game called Warlords of Eternum. The problem with the team was like, it, it, they were totally demoralized. They didn't know what to do. Um, the lead of the team and the director of that section of the studio were, I don't want to say incompetent, but they believed they had a vision. They knew this concept could work, but they didn't know how to make it happen. Here's what I did. I made a board game <laughs> out of it and I changed the design to something that I knew would be fun in a tactic setting with a hex hexagonal grid. And then we started play testing it and we refined it and we play tested it and we refined it and boom, we had something really fun. That was largely thanks to my influence, but <clears throat> I had no interest in continuing to work for, for that lead because he was definitely pretty high on the narcissism scale somewhere and uh, totally incompetent when it came to game design. <clears throat> and that was just too frustrating for me. So I just said, look, we'll finish my contract and then I, but then I'm not staying uh, permanently because this is too frustrating for me. While I was there, all the people I worked with were amazing. It was super fun. We all went, drank beers together and it was totally a great environment. I love Wuga. I would definitely work for them again. I had an opportunity to be their design director and unfortunately because of circumstances here in Thailand I was unable to accept that position. But maybe another opportunity will arise in the future. We'll see. Berlin is a beautiful city by the way. If you've never been I highly recommend going to visit. But what's funny about Warlords of Eternum, so the lead designer took Warlords of Eternum to another company which bought it and he continued to work on it there. And then a new company formed and they made their own version. And then that got the attention of Warhammer. So they worked with Games Workshop and made Warhammer Tacticus. So if you've seen the commercials for Warhammer Tacticus, or you've already downloaded it to your phone and played it, it's actually a good game. And it's based on my design, like <laughs> the gameplay elements and how the units move and everything based on my design. I don't get a penny for any of that shit. The, the least snow print could do is like, you know, send me a bonus check for Christmas or something. So Geek Words, even though Geek Words was already made at infinity levels, I did get it back and then I relaunched it in 2017. So its first launch was in 2016. And then in 2017, I re-released it on iOS and 
Android and it was doing well. And, um, it got a sudden bump from Saudi Arabia. I don't know how it happened or why, but like it, like I saw gangbuster sales for like one month. Oh, and I got featured by the Apple store because they love their puns. They said, uh, cast a, it was Halloween. So they're like, cast a spell, like spell check, I guess. And uh, I got a huge bump from that too. So GeekWords was doing well, but it had all these bugs. Because I didn't do the initial development on it, it was like spaghetti stuff. I've been looking for someone to help me fix it or just make a new version of it. And I found uh, a dev who did help me with the Steam version. That was done in Godot though. But the original version was done in Unity. And um, it had a bunch of server stuff that didn't work. So people would get messages like internet connection not found and just weird stuff that totally f things up. I found another dev to do the Android and iPhone versions. Um, but unfortunately he's not <laughs> delivering yet. So it's, it's become embarrassingly long. Um, oh, Azure dev. Azure dev helped me make, uh, the one that's on steam and is very clean. It's not like a lot of bells and whistles. It's very clean. So I, I really appreciate his work on that. And I hope to, that it makes some money so that I can send him some. Um, so far, I owe him 50 bucks. Replica is an AI companion. And the original concept for Replica was that um, this woman's friend had died, Eugenia, I think. And she wanted to have sort of a living memory of him that she could talk with. They wanted it so that you could make your own version of yourself. But while I was working with Mobile Game Doctor, whom, by the way, I met while working at uh, Wooga, the mobile game doctor, Dave Rorrell, who worked, uh, who was uh, one of the producers for <clears throat> Plants vs. Zombies, the original, he formed his own consultancy studio. So I work with mobile game doctor periodically whenever they need uh, me for something. And this was one of the things they wanted me to, to help with. So I worked on Replica to provide potential new gameplay that they could add to it. You know, you would chat with the thing, but they didn't, it didn't do any games or anything and to help with their monetization, monetization and user experience. So I helped develop that. Uh, they saw really good results from that. Then they wanted to work with me again, but they didn't want to pay our fee. So <laughs> that didn't work out. Right after that, I got to work on, since Warcraft 3, this is my favorite, Wasteland 3. In Exile was looking for writers. Uh, I applied and it was all remote, so it was perfect. And I got to work with their writing team and it was like such a fun experience to work with seasoned writers who like build on each other. It was, it was fun. It was a really fun experience. I wrote a lot of stuff for Wasteland 3. I think my recent post on Patreon, I went into all the little bits and, and things that I did for it. It was a lot of incidental writing and then a lot of uh, some main scenes and some, a couple of uh, important characters like fish lips. And, uh, I really love if they're going to do a wasteland Four, I hope that they'll reach out to me again, but maybe not because they laid off all the writers at the end, except for the original core team. That's just how it goes in the game industry, but you know, I'm a contractor. So, all right, Battleverse arena. So I was just a monetization user experience, uh, recommendations for them. I think they eventually went like full NFT. <laughs> but that was a short little consultancy, but they were, they seemed cool. And the game itself was pretty fun. It was like a one V one. No, they did do two V two and three V three. Yeah. And it's for phones. So Android and iPhone infinite fleet shipped, but I can't really take much credit for anything in there other than the main backstory and most of the characters and stuff I had some influence on the, the irony for infinite fleet was I had uh, written all that stuff and, and gave it to them. And then I just moved on to other stuff because there wasn't a lot for me to do. But then they hired another writer, a junior writer. And then the junior writer reached out to me at random. <laughs> like he didn't know I worked on Infinite Fleet at any point. And he asked about if I would help him figure out what to, what to do for Infinite Fleet. And I've said, well, why don't you just use the original stuff? Here it is. And I gave him all the original writing and stuff that, that I'd done for it. He's like, oh, this is amazing. Why weren't they using this? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> Clearly they need it again and forgot they had it or or something. So he used that as the basis for, for that. And so I was happy to help it out uh, and uh, <laughs> get that going again. Did not receive any pay for that. For Yota Games in China, they needed lore and writing for a game called Everlegion. And if you play Everlegion, which is available on Android and iPhone, it is a AFK Arena clone but they use 3D, so they 
then it, then it's okay, I guess. But I'm telling you straight up, they cloned all of the design, like straight up from numbers to everything else. And all we did was rewrite and do new art for all the characters. And, and uh, I wrote a completely new story based on like how many missions there were going to be. And so if you play Everlegion, the basic outline of that story is still there. I think they've been updating it with more and more text, which I advised against because people stop reading at a certain point. Whatever. No one listens to me in China, no matter what. Next up. So here's where we get into the NFT stuff. So I worked for a company called Rebel Labs for a little bit, and uh, they were making a game called Legends of Crypto. It was going to be a card game. It was a struggle. There was like clearly some rampant narcissism from the owner. I pitched something based on the Final Fantasy game, uh, Triple Triad, and I expanded it where there was more hit points involved and so you had to rely on spells and abilities and things on the cards to do more damage to clear spaces as opposed to just placing a card and turning them and instead you were destroying the card and if you destroyed the card you move forward and then you could do damage to the next card if there was an enemy card there it was it was really cool it exists you can go play it if you want or a demo of it and the problem is as i finished the first draft and i was starting on designing all the abilities the owner of the studio basically who's never made a game in his life i basically had a conversation with him where i said i asked him flat out like are you planning to take over the game design and game development of this game and he said absolutely and i'm like okay this is my resignation <laughs> here's my two weeks notice not that i really had to do that but uh i went ahead and collected the money for the remainder of the contract and uh advised the other workers at the studio but he fucked it all up and then eventually they had to hire another new designer and then that guy fucked it up even more and now it looks like they've returned to most of the original design that i had laid out but they didn't get to the ability stuff even though i gave them the worksheet that had all the abilities and stuff that i was planning to do so they just couldn't couldn't realize that vision unfortunate maybe i'll make a triple triad card game in the future at some point i worked with avagachi just that was a weird one i was consulting they were they needed help with their tokenomics. What that turned out to mean was that they just wanted me to do stuff and like make it work, but they had no idea what they even wanted. So everything I would do would be like, and this relies on you guys doing X, Y, and Z. And they're like, huh? And I'm like, oh no. <laughs> like, I can't make decisions for your company. You have to have something in place. Like you have to know how much money you need. And like, I need these things in order to work towards those goals when I'm doing monetization sort of stuff. And they just had no clue. They got frustrated with me because I was asking them for information that they clearly didn't understand. And uh, no matter how much I dumbed it down, they didn't get it. So I moved on. Magic craft. I don't remember what I did. I think it was just consulting and then it all fell apart as a lot of things did in with the NFTs. I think I... I've consulted with like over 16 different NFT projects at this point. There's maybe like four or five left. <laughs> uh, Eternal Elves, I did a lot of writing for them. Um, and I created a, uh, a couple of things to generate names. <laughs> so they just told me how many NFTs they have and how many names they need. And I created a generator to create all those names, uh, which is just a spreadsheet with like Monkai. Oh, that was a painful one. So Monkai was a NFT project I invested in because I really liked the art. And somehow I got involved and I offered stupidly to write their anime because that was one of the things they were offering. I'm like, yeah, I could, I would like to write an anime because I've been doing script writing for a while. So I finished the first episode of the anime and then the owner of the project vanished. <laughs> and when you do that in the NFT world, it's a rug pull. <laughs> it's called a rug pull and everyone freaks out. And so like the whole community turned toxic and I'm like, yeah, I wrote this anime, but nobody cares. So I'm just sitting on that one. I did board game design for Sync Dow called Sync Friends, which was supposed to, it was going to teach how money works, which is a really interesting board game to make. Because once you understand how money works, holy fuck, it is a fiction built on nothing. Let me tell you. I already knew most of it, but when I delved into the mechanics of how money works, it's a mind blower, like just how <clears throat> everything doesn't fall apart immediately right now. Soulcraft, I'm still working with Soulcraft. I wrote a lot of their uh, lore and I'm an advisor for uh, game design and, and stuff. If you're, if you are not scared of NFTs and you're interested in a Warcraft like game, this one's a hero defense game for the moment, but it is planned to expand out into a full RTS at some point in the far future. Uh, Soulcraft is fun. I know the, there's only one developer right now 
but he is committed, 100% committed and capable of delivering a game. So uh, I recommend checking that out if you get a chance. Altered State Machines hired me to work on uh, an unannounced boxing game. Basically, it was a sim. And so I had to break down boxing into like the core elements, and that was super fun. Boxing is, is a very interesting sport from a game design mechanics combat perspective because it only has a very limited set of moves, and they're all just those moves over and over again or com combinations of those moves. There are not that many combinations. Then I became the chief of game design for Engines of Fury. I'm still working with them. Uh, they're making an a action RPG survival game, top-down shooter. It's actually going to be pretty fun. Things are progressing. It's a small team and they're mostly noobs, but I'm helping helping them get that done. And it's I think it'll be a good game when it's ready to ship. Going to be in pre-alpha uh, soon, within the next quarter, I think. Stormgate, we've reached the end. This isn't every game that I've worked on, but this is like the vast majority of it. And most of these have shipped. So now I'm working with Frost Giant on Stormgate. I am on the campaign design team and I'm having fun making my own levels again. And uh, I've been giving a lot of feedback on the how the on things about the game that that I think can be improved. And, you know, it, it is an indie studio. That's what people don't realize. Like they're not owned by anyone else. This is their own studio. The two Tims founded it, Tim Morton and Tim Campbell. And uh, I don't think they get enough credit for being an indie studio in this environment. It's scary to not have a publisher, but they just had their Kickstarter. If you haven't seen that, go check that out. And the Kickstarter was just for additional stuff. Like the the funding for the game has already been secured. We have that runway. So all of that is good. The Kickstarter was for additional stuff because we wanted to have physical elements. I think any additional funds from that are going to end up uh, helping us expand uh, one or two new positions for the runway. Because <clears throat> remember, it's not you can't just hire someone based on one year salary. You have to hire them based on the salary for the time of that game. So let's say that someone gets paid uh, you know, seventy thousand a year, then if you know you need them for two years, you need to have 140,000 set aside because that's how runway works. <laughs> but in the meantime, you can collect uh, interest and stuff on that. Collector's edition, yeah. So they made some physical stuff for the collector's edition, including like this mech guy who's pretty cool. So there you go. That is 25 years of game development history. It's not everything. And there are certainly a lot of stories in between all of this stuff, but those are all the games that have shipped. This is my ludography. So you can see my aggregate career at the bottom. bottom. I've worked for 34 studios. <laughs> I've worked for 34 studios. I've worked on 40 different titles. The average score for my games are 83.1. I've released, 28 of these games have released across 29 different genres. 23 of them were mobile, nine of them were console, 26 were for PC, 13 were for crypto. That is my career in a nutshell right there at the bottom. It's kind of funny when you look at it that way. <clears throat> and if you go back and you look at like uh, one of the first talks I ever gave was in Sweden. It was about, it was called the games of your life. And it was like, how many games do you get to work on? It, like the average career is 10 years and the average number of titles you would work on during that time period is like five or six. I didn't have a huge amount of input from people. Uh, so it wasn't like a great study, but it's, it's amazing that I've gotten to work on as many titles as I have, especially when you get to work on things like Warcraft 3, Reign of Chaos, and World of Warcraft, Oddworld Strangers of Wrath is so underrated. It's so painful. Getting to fix a game like Penny Dell Crosswords is actually a lot of fun going into the analytics and figuring out demographics and all that stuff. Making a tactics game that then got copied three times is hilarious to me. But whatever. <laughs> uh, I really enjoyed making Word Ventures the Vampire Pirate. Uh, Wasteland 3, I think, is a, an amazing uh, tactics RPG that I doesn't get enough uh, play or love, especially with all the little tidbits we put into it. If you like weird, creepy, post-apocalyptic, like the weirdest parts of Fallout, like Wasteland 3 is amazing. And we've got on the horizon Engines of Fury and Stormgate, which I think will be are two very different games. Though ironically, if you think about it, Engines of Fury is effectively like a Diablo style game, but a shooter. And Stormgate is an RTS. So I've gone back <laughs> to my roots of RTS and, and uh, ARPGs, which is kind of funny. <clears throat>
Thank you, everyone, for coming. You've all leveled up. And, um, if I don't see you guys later, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Hey guys, it's me again. If you are not a patron yet, remember it's only a dollar a month to get access to all the documents mentioned within this 25 years of history. If you can afford more, I'd be overjoyed to accept it. The money from Patreon goes towards finding ways to create more and better content, so hopefully that's of interest to you. If you saw my documentation that you want to get a hold of but can't afford the fee, don't even worry about it. Come to my Discord, ask me, and I'll give it to you. Thank you so much for watching, and have a beautiful life.